Let's go join me in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you. We ask you, Lord, to be with us today. We ask you to speak to us. We ask you, Lord, to, again, as we look at this new series about who we are really in you, our true identity, my prayer, Lord, is that we would be able to answer this question based on how the scripture defines it. Not how the world defines it, but how you define it for us. Lord, thank you. Bless our time together. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Before we start, look at the person sitting right next to you. Give that person a big, big smile. All right. I know maybe you're wondering why I'm asking that. Because either you're going to, you know, because you can see it in, in people's eyes. Haven't you noticed that when they're smiling or not? We've been great at, you know, looking at facial expressions today because of the mask. But here's what I want to say, okay? As we look at this, and I believe um, God will be, our series today is about that true identity. Who am I in Christ? The question is, who am I? Maybe you've asked this question. Maybe um, some of us have, uh, so it's not working, so I'm just gonna go click this, I don't know. All right, so who am I? If you're going to be honest today, you have asked that question at least once or more than once, right? Who am I? It's a very simple question, but yet a little bit complicated if you ask me. A little complicated to answer. The easiest way to answer this is just to say, who am I? I am Robert M. Burn Jr. I live in a certain place. Come on now. And I am, as you can see, half African American and also half Filipino. Very simple. It's a simple answer to that question. But yet you know when you ask that question, who am I? It's, there is something deeper in that question. So I have told you it's easy. I define you based on that question, my name, my ethnicity, where I live. I could give you my social security number, but of course, a lot of people that advise me don't. But yet, when you answer that question, there are many layers for you to be able to respond to that question. Some of it would be, who am I based on your, in the U.S., credit score? A certain number that is attached to your name. Social security number, so of course now your value is based on the credit score that is attached. So there's like this credit bureau that defines who I am. But yet you know that's not what we're talking about here. Because that is easy. But the sad part is, is that we have let the world define who we are. What we do, certain numbers attached to your name, or certain letters after your name or before your name. Like D and R, Robert Hearn Jr., sounds great. But I can put that because I didn't go to med school. <laughs> so that means that would be a lie and a perjury. Or certain Letters after my name, Robert Hearn, PhD. Sounds nice. Thank you, Myra. But I can't do that too because I'm going to go to school. For me to earn the right to put those three letters after my name. But yet when you encounter people, when they introduce themselves to you, when you ask them, hey, who are you? And I'm like, doctor. The two letters spell a whole lot of difference. Somehow you're a little bit hesitant, but yet, the doctor, all right. Right? If you're going to the clinic to have yourself checked, if there's some medical condition, you want to have those two letters before the name. Hello. Because that gives you confidence, right? That you are in the right place. Or if you are in school, and the professor has those three letters after, then hmm, I'm in the right place. But yet, here's what we're going to talk about today, but this is something different when you look at the Bible. I'm not saying, please, that those are not important if you're pursuing higher education, by all means. But is that really who we are when we look at the Bible? 
So we will let the scripture define us, not what the world will define us, for us to be able to answer this question. And for that, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 3, and this is the baptism of Jesus Christ. And somehow at this very moment, when the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was present, and we could hear the Father speaking to Jesus that would define who He is, and also His mission and His calling in life. So let's read that, starting on Mark 3, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill our righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well Please, let's look at this text and understand the context that is going on here. Starting at verse 13, you would see that Jesus went from Galilee to Jordan. So that means he intentionally went to this place to be baptized by John. You may be asking, so why is Jesus going there to be baptized by John? Because this baptism is what? Baptism by water or the washing. That means a baptism of repentance. So that means that Jesus was there. So he's being baptized with water of repentance. So he's a sinner. So he needs to repent. No. Nope. Because the Bible says that he is sinless. So what is happening here? So he was going there according to him. What? To fulfill our, our righteousness. I need to be baptized by you. Look at this on verse 15. It is so now. It is proper for us to do this. To fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. What is that? Because at this particular moment, Jesus was shifting this particular moment from a repentance moment for him to be what? For his ordination and confirmation of really, you know, launching him to his calling and mission. Hence, many theologians would say that this very baptism has many similarities if you look at the Old Testament on how a priest is actually ordained or chosen. Or also a king, how a king is chosen. So that's why theologians would say that this is indeed the what the affirmation of Jesus calling as a priest and also as a king. Why? Because as you could see, the Holy Spirit descending on Jesus. That means in the Old Testament, when a priest, which is a mediator between God and man, is called, they would pour oil on them. The Holy Spirit is always that symbolized as that. Anointing oil. And also a king. Remember, a prophet would be what? Choosing a king, just like Samuel choosing David. You know, Samuel choosing, choosing Saul. They would come to the king, anoint him with oil, and then there would be a proclamation among the people. So this is somehow Jesus was saying, we have to do this to fulfill all righteousness. So this is shifting now. And as we could see, Look at this. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And that moment, heaven was open. Wow. So imagine if you're one of those. Imagine John was baptizing. There's several people there. This is not just a moment between just John the Baptist and Jesus. Because he was baptizing people. So there are several people that have witnessed this. So imagine if you're there, you're going to get water baptized and you don't know Jesus. Remember in one story, John the Baptist point to Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember that? It is at this very moment. And he was there. I don't know if that would be me. I would be standing there. Heaven was opening. Whoa. And then the Holy Spirit descending like a dove. Whoa. And can you read this with me? And lightning on him. So there's like a big spotlight that was put on Jesus, man. And we're like, so I'm like, wow. And I'll be like, where's mine? <laughs> so I got baptized, but there's nothing like that. Because what the scripture was telling us, that this is a divine moment. This is a divine moment. This is not just an ordinary moment. And that's why 
We look at verse 17, and here's where we're going to focus. And a voice from heaven said, wow. Heaven opened up. Holy Spirit descending like a dove. And then a voice. I'm like, wow. So I'll be there like, whoa. So pretty much for me, when I read this, it's like a concert. <laughs> you know, because... <laughs> and then something falling down, and then a voice. Of course, it's going to be loud. It's coming from heaven. Hello. This is my son, whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Oh, my. Whoa. So, what is the meaning of this? Why is this important? You have to understand. This is before even Jesus began his ministry. He has not done any single miracle yet. Nothing. Zero. Maybe we could say, kind of. But yet, at this moment, you could see the account of Mark and even in Matthew, that this is him. After this, he was launched into his ministry. The closest maybe is that the miracle at uh, at Cana, where he turned water into wine, but he said to his mo mother that, no, I have not, my time has not come yet. But after this, yet, but he has not preached. So why is this important? What is the meaning of that? Look up here. The Father declares to Jesus when there's nothing yet that he has done for God. Nothing. going back to what I've said because sometimes our identity is based on what we have done. What we have accomplished. The Father didn't set this at the end of Jesus' ministry. But at the beginning. So, what's the truth that we could learn from this as we look at this event? I'm going to share to you lies from the enemy and the truth that we need to embrace. Just like what I told you, we need to look at the lens through the lens of the scripture for us to be able to answer that question, who am I? Let me share to you three lies and three truths based on that encounter. Are you ready for that? Yes. All right. So let's read it. A voice from heaven said. A voice from heaven. Interesting, isn't it? A simple, uh, what? Three words, but yet so powerful. What is the truth here that you need to understand? First, let's look at the lie. Here's the first lie. Your identity is defined by others. That's a lie. Come on. Lie. That's not the truth. But yet you have believed that all your life. That your identity is based by what? Is defined by by others. So what do I mean by this? This is a lie that we need to break. Somehow we need to take this out of our head because this is what we have been conditioned about. We live in a world where a person's identity is often based on the validation, approval, and opinion of others. Right? What do I mean? Our family background. Oh, so and so. Oh, he's a great guy because you know he has the surname of a her. There's certain surnames that commands what? Value and approval from people. So when you look at, when you hear the whole surname her, uh -huh. but if my surname is either Jobs, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, listen, you know. Gates, if you're in the Philippines, Ayala. Certain surname, family background, that's why we protect that. And somehow, when if you are grew up in a family when there is a surname is valuable, that has been what handed down to you, and what it was preached to you that that's your identity. I'm not saying it's not, but that's not entirely what this is. Come on now. Next is this: not only your lineage, your education. You're valuable because of certain educational attainment that you get in life. Please, I'm not saying don't get to, don't go to school and don't study. I studied. I finished my university. But yet, that's not only my identity. Not only that, education, race. 
This nation is defined by that. Yeah? We are proud. Yes, I'm not saying, please, that you push away your identity. I'm, I am happy to be biracial, to be honest. I am both Filipino and African American. And yes, I love it both. I don't have to choose. Because number one, my, my mom and my dad decided that I'm going to be like this. The last time I remember, I didn't vote. He just made it happen. But yet, here's what it, here we are. Certain value, because the other people define that. If there's a certain color, that means you're more privileged than others. Come on, let's be honest. I mean, are we, are we, am I talking to the right crowd? That's why in the Philippines growing up, okay, all, at least my high school and college female friends want to get a lighter skin. Yes, there's a lot. Papaya soap, <laughs> glutathione that they put and inject and I'm like, what's going on? Asking all that you scrub your skin, and the problem is that your face is so white, and then from here to here you're dark. It's like you're glow in the dark because you have scrub your face so much just to look lighter. Please, I'm not. I'm, I'm just sharing with you experiences here because we have to look a certain way, defined by others, and a certain color complexion gets you what? In certain places. Come on! Yeah. <laughs> so you don't like this preaching? Sorry, I'm just telling the truth. But some of you, you didn't choose that. You were born in that complexion. So I'm not saying you're bad because of that certain complexion. I'm saying is that what's being defined by this world? Defined by certain accents. So if your accent is French, oh wow. Even though they can't understand you, they're still like, wow, that's really nice, you're so cool. <laughs> Mademoiselle? <laughs> oui? oui? Merci beaucoup. Oh wow, I like that. I'm gonna learn that because it's uh, defined. But if you sound like Filipino, let's go over there. <laughs> so like, yeah, it's, it's an ugly accent. So now who's, who's defining that? Let's go over there and let's let's buy some food. I'm not I'm not ashamed of my accent. This is who I am. Let me I want you to look up here. Everybody has one. Why are we defining that the other one is better than the other? Everybody has an accent. Have you hurt yourself? So but yet we define one is better than the other. Because the world defines it for us. Not only that, let's go look at it. Finances. How much money you have and you don't have. Your short social status. Again, here in this nation, zip codes, where you live. They hear your zip code. Ah, bad place. <laughs> because the big place is bad, then you are bad. Come on. And today, the most uh, it's interesting about this now is that political affiliation. It's defined by people. So if you are part of a certain party, then I'm not going to go mingle with you. So we have put this stigma on certain parties that one party is either bad and the other one is good. Come on. This is what it is. That's a lie. Your identity is defined by others. In many occasions, these are used to determine our identity. The reality is this. It has become a prevailing mindset on people. And the problem is this. As we become what? Believers in the Lord. We still carry that mindset in us. That's why we attend church. We come to church. Oh, it's all brown. I don't like this. It's all brown. 
and I'm not brown. Or they're all dark or black, and I don't like that. Hmm. Sad. You know, when the father spoke to Jesus, he says, this is my son, and his zip code is in heaven. <laughs> zero, 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 one. Here's the first zip code. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, no, no, it's not what it said. For Jesus, as you see, you could see this, the only defining authority is God. The only defining authority is God. Where do we see that? A voice from heaven. Not from here below, from above. Come on now. The defining authority is the voice from above. Not the voice here. Because if you're going to listen to the voice below, what you're going to hear is that it's based on your what? Color. It's based on your zip code. It's based on your educational attainment. For Jesus, here's what it is. The only defining authority was God the Father. What? Speaking from heaven down to Jesus. That's what it is. So that would define him. Amen? Not the crowd. Many times in the encounter of Jesus, the crowd wanted to make him king. Jesus said, no, because I'm already king according to my God. Why are you making me something that God didn't speak to me? Or define me? So many times if you read the scripture, the religious leaders will try to define him. His disciples will try to define him. Also what? The crowd. Because they got fed. They wanted to make him king. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Why? Because I've already been defined from above. My father defined me. In the last 40 years, there's an indication, here's the study, that we see ourselves, is the, the way we see ourselves is determined to a large degree on the way we act and react in life. So that's why for Jesus, here's the truth. Let me just share this to you. Not the others will define you, here's the truth. Truth number one, God defines you. No one else. God is the only authority, authority in your life. Our identity is based on what God says. He is our creator. He gives us the correct information. He is the one we should be listening to about who we are. Just like Jesus listening to the Father, defining Him. Not anyone else. Amen? Because here's the problem. How we view ourselves determines our behavior. Why is this important? Here's what it is. If we see ourselves as a loser, we end up in a large degree acting like a loser. If we see ourselves as a victim, we tend to let people victimize us. Hmm. The sad truth is this. Many people, including believers, have mistakenly viewed themselves because of the inaccurate information they have received from misinformed and unauthorized sources in their lives. Sad to say, as much as we love our moms and dads, sometimes they have defined us wrong. The only way for us to be able to do this is that understand God will define you. You are unique. You're, no, you're not like the other. Have you noticed there's no similar fingerprint, retina scan, whatever, that whole facial recognition thing? Unique. Look at the person sitting right next to you. Tell that person you are unique. And here's the good news. Uh -huh. And here's the good news. You are unique. And here's the bad news. You are unique. <laughs> There's no one like you. So please, don't turn me into someone that I am not. Because God says, and God, be, and God deemed, this is original copyright here. 
This person standing right before you, this is the original copy. But the problem is this, the world wanted us to follow people like in the media, the way they dress, the way, because they wanted you to be a replica. That's one of the enemy's lie. He wants you to be a replica of someone. But yet God says, from heaven, this is my son. And you know what that is? Here's the truth. You are a child of God. And that definition is this. You are a child of God. Amen. That's why, here's what it says. This is my whom? Son. If I am God's son, that means I am important. And that definition is this. How many you notice that starts this definition when he pronounces to Jesus, the first is a relational definition. Son. Relational. Because that's the greatest gift that you could ever receive. More than wealth. More than the blessing that Jai declared a while ago. Yes. How many of you here you want the, you want the blessing of God in your life? Come on. Come on. No one? I want blessings. I want it to pour out in my life. But the most important blessing is this. Your sonship. You are a son and a daughter of God. That is the greatest blessing. Look what God, what does God say about us? Look at this. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become what? Children of God. This is who you are. You are a child of God. The enemy wants to think that you are a loser, that you are nothing, you don't have value, nothing, but no, you are not. That is a lie. That's why the enemy is trying hard to let the world or the voice here, down here to define you. And he wants to take that away from you. The voice from heaven speaking into your life, defining who you are. Come on. More than being a pastor, I'm God's son. This is not my definition. That means I could quit this if God wants me anytime. Because that's not my definition. You are a son. You are a daughter of God. Come on. Do you, do you, do you see the depth of this definition? If you are his son and daughter, look up here. You are his that means you belong to him. You don't belong to this world. You belong to him. Wow. Because your identity is found in whose you are. Who do you belong to? Not just who I am, but whose I am. I belong to him. Because I'm his son. You belong to him because you are his daughter. But yet we try to live. But the world will define us into something that we are not. And we are happy about that. Here's the problem. I have read so many stories about, you know, a vagabond or a beggar. And then later in life, they would find out that, you know, an inheritance was given to them. How many more stories did we have read about that? Like a beggar begging for food. And then after that, he realized that he had about nine, fifty million dollars, $90 million. Come on. Have you read my, one of those stories? I have read a lot. And I'm like, I always wanted to say, Lord, why not me? <laughs> so that's why I've been waiting for some inheritance somewhere, you know, that someone who's going to knock on my door and say, hey, guess what? Your uncle so-and-so from a distant so-and-so passed away and you have certain amount so-and-so. I'm like, yes. But I figured if that's going to happen because my family is huge, I'm going to be last on the totem pole. I'm not going to get anything by the time it gets to me. But it just, you know, it warms the idea. It warms your heart with the idea that there's something. I'm not who I am. I'm actually valuable. Why don't you look up here? You're a son and daughter of God. It's the most, the greatest spiritual blessing that you're ever going to receive in your life. That's why the enemy is fighting for you not to understand that. 
even for some, destroying you from the very beginning, your mother's womb. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next seven weeks. As Paul declared that in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14, that you are chosen, adopted, redeemed, forgiven, loved by God. We're going to look at those each and every week. What does that mean? That's the greatest blessing that you will ever have. Amen? Amen? And here's the next one. As we continue on this, Matthew chapter 17, verse, a voice from heaven, this is my son. Here's what I love. Woo! I love this. Whom I love. Woo! 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 Here's, let's go on the lie first, okay? Before we go to the truth. Here's the lie. God doesn't love me. Have it? You know this? That's always been our struggle. God doesn't love me. Why? Here's what it is. God doesn't like me. He likes Pastor Robert, but definitely not me. Oh, he likes Alex. He likes Ivan. Because Ivan is a chef. <laughs> and I am not. I can't cook. I cook some eggs. It, it's burnt. <laughs> Most probably, Ivan is loved by God more than me because I can't cook. Because we compare based on what we see on other people. Have you noticed? Oh, Jimmy is loved by God more than me because look at him, he's just so dressed up today. Come on, man. I just so. I'll take you shopping, fucking up. Here we go. <laughs> Definitely, Jai is loved by God more than me. Why? Because he could play all instruments and he could sing. We base God's love based on certain things that we don't have. So, because I am not like this, the conclusion is that I am not loved. But let's go back to the text here. The context is Jesus hasn't done anything yet. He was loved because of the relationship. He's his son. I don't know about you. If you have kids, you love them. You have your kids. I love my daughters. They came into this world actually not giving me anything. And to be more practical here, and to be more honest, when they came in, they brought me a lot of bills. <laughs> On set. Let me explain to you how. Number one, I have to buy that pregnancy test kit. That costs money. At the very beginning, just to find out if my wife is pregnant, I have to buy. And then after that, when you say, yes, guess what? Check them. Co pays. You still pay. And series of tests. Pay, 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 pay. After that, of course, I have to what? Buy my wife some certain things that she needs to eat. Because she's carrying that baby. <laughs> the doctor says, I need to buy this. Why? For the health of the baby. We don't even eat that. It's too expensive. After that, full term, delivery room, everything, paying. How many you notice? They have not done nothing, but I'm paying. I'm paying. Pay. I'm just saying, if you're sitting here, and you're, you should be grateful to your parents. Pay, man. So they came out, pay. After that, I paid. Before I can get out of the hospital, I have to pay. Or if not, I'm going to write some promissory note promising that I don't have the money, but I'm going to pay it at a certain time. Pay? ka -ching. Guess what? You have to buy them clothes. And their clothes are expensive for crying out loud for such a small clothes. And they outgrow that in three weeks. Pay? ka -ching. And here we go, the checkup. <laughs> you think it's free? It's not. You bring them to the hospital, go pay, ka -ching. And then another test that needs to be done, ka -ching. And you're scratching. Wow, I'm paying a lot. And they grow up. Every grade, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching, ka -ching. <laughs> But they have done, to be honest, nothing. Messed up my home. <laughs> I have to buy some what? You know, childproof some spaces, some, you know, doors. Come on! 
and I have to sit down and watch these endless cartoons because they love it. But you watch it a hundred times. I don't even watch my basketball game that much. Maybe it tries at the very most, or maybe I would go back from time to time some classic games. But this one, man, you sit down. Blue's Clues then was the thing, and I'm sitting there. I'm watching this blue dog jumping around, and Dora the Explorer for my second one. I'm like, we're gonna go. I'm the man, I'm the man, I'm the man. I'm like, what? But yet, when your daughter says, look, Dad, I want you to watch this with me, you can't say no. Switch off from ESPN and watch Dora the Explorer. <laughs> and you know what's going to happen. It's the same story. It's the same plot. It never changed. <laughs> and then after you finish watching with your child would say, let's watch it again. <laughs> no, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we do it? We love them. Because that's your baby right there. I have done some things for my daughters that I'm never going to do on my own. Because I love them. Especially this one right here in the middle. <laughs> the first one. The first one. Because that's the whole break in. The first one. She got to ballet. Come on. Dad buying for big letter. Anyway. <laughs> Why? Because I love my kids. Why don't you look up here? God's love you. God loves you. Here's the truth. God loves you. Let that settle in your heart. God loves you. Have you done anything for the Lord before? He looks at you. <laughs> Grace, mercy extended to you. Ka-ching, ka-ching. Done nothing. But God loves you. Look at Jesus. I love this in John 15, verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. The same love that was spoken to him, this is my son, whom I love, is the same love that was given to him. Do you get this? When you watch what was happening there, the father speaking to Jesus, declaring to everyone, I love this son of mine, is the same love that was given to him. Same. The same love. And God declared it also, uh, sorry, demonstrated it. Romans 5 8. But God demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That means, what you look up here, in your worst of worst, God loved you. How much more now when you have given your life to Him? But yet we believe the lie. You are not loved by God because you have done this, because this is what you do, did before, based on your past, based on what you did this morning. You are not loved. My two daughters are not saints. They have made some mistakes, but my love didn't change. I still love them. And they know that. And I will do everything. You see, I didn't grow up without a, I, I grew up without a dad. And it's tough. I didn't understand the father's love until I became one. Until I became a father. When I was holding my daughters in my hand, I realized this love. But somehow just overwhelmed me. Nobody taught me, nobody sat me down, but yet I know. That at that particular moment where I was holding my two daughters, that I would do anything for them. And I would accept them for who they are. Here's number three. 
a voice from heaven said, this is my son, whom I love. I am well pleased. What is this? Let's look at the NLT version of this. I am well pleased. Who brings me great joy? God loves, God the Father loves Jesus so much. And here's what the God the Father declared. He brings me great joy. So much delight and pleasure. Here's the lie. We put it on the screen. Performance plus people's opinion equals my worth. Here's a lie from the enemy. Performance plus people's opinion equals my worth. So that means I have to perform. Produce something, do this, do that, and all of those. Plus, if I listen to what you say, then that's going to be my worth. Actually, it's not. That's a lie. That's a lie. And we have believed that. That a person's value and worth is measured or gauged based on our performance. But that's how we've been preconditioned ever since. I'm not saying you be lazy, but go ahead, it's sports. You know, I have to be the best for me to be able to be accepted or for me to value in this team. Either football, basketball. Yeah, I have to perform. There's a competition between quarterback. I have to beat this guy. I have to beat my topmost performance for me to be what? To be considered more valuable than the other. My worth goes up. It depends on my performance. That's why here's the problem. Okay? That's how the world operates. And then you bring that into your relationship with God. You bring that. I have to what? Perform. That means, okay, if I was reading what? Three chapters, I need to have what? Read four or five. Then, you know, I need to serve in the church. If people are serving, you know, once a week, I'm going to do four. I have sat down with a lot of people, cautioning them and said, please, you're getting your value based on what you do. That's not what it is. What I do, when I serve, when I preach here, it's out of the, my abundance of what? Gra uh, gratefulness from the Lord. It's coming out of love. It's not coming out of what? Because I want to prove my worth. Performance, people's opinion, that's your worth. You have to be careful if you're a parent. Because indirectly, you might be sending this mindset to your kids. That's why they're messed up when they grow up, like you and I. Where's the A? If there's no A, you're not valuable. But you have not sat down. You have not sat down with them what's going on in their life. Especially for Asian parents. Ching, 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 ching. That's most of us here. Because we have to show the diplomas on our wall. Together with our plastic covered couch. <laughs> because, I want you to look up here. Because those adds value to our family. My question has always been for my kids, and they know that, and they're here, is that, did you do your best for the Lord? That I gotta be, did you give your best? Because God knows that you gave your best for God. I said yes, that's good. They got an A plus, did you give your best? For the Lord, same question, regardless of whatever grades they approach me with. For us, A, worthy, B, A, then, C, you're sleeping in the couch, F, you're disowned by the family. <laughs> and we heard words like, which genes do you have? Because all your aunties and uncles and brothers are lawyers and this and that and what? people's opinion equals your work. So today, if I don't preach well, I feel bad. But that's not my worth. If 
finally sinking on me. It took about 35 minutes. Again, that's how we've been preconditioned to say, here's the truth. Read this with me, please. God delights in you. Woo! <laughs> God delights in me. God is pleased. Jesus pleases the Father as no one else does. As you read this story, what's fascinating as we have mentioned over and over is that God, the Father said this about Jesus even before he did any ministry. He delights in him. God delights in you as well. So, scripture here, Psalm 147, verse 11. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. God delights in you as you make a decision to follow him. I love this because we have to quantify this. The Lord delights in those who fear Him. That means if you are following God, if you're putting your hope in Him, God looks at you and I'm like, Whoa, I'm so happy with Jen. I'm so happy with Victor. I'm so happy with Annie. I'm so happy with Jerome. He delights over you. Zephaniah, right? 3, 14 to 16 and 17. 14, 15, 16. Read that on your own. He said, he rejoices over you with singing. When God sees you, he rejoices that he just sees you. Oh, Christian, he's awake. Love him so much. You wake up your eyes when you wake up in the morning. Sorry, you wake up your eyes. You open your eyes. So you wake up in the morning, God sees you, He delights in you. But yet we have this, no, Lord, I have, I have to do this for you to like me. Lord, I have to do this for you, Lord, to embrace me. Lord, I have to do this. And, and God says, no, 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 no. By simply being my son, you bring me great joy. I remember when my kids, when they were when they were young, and even now, of course, but it started when they were young, I would hold them. And of course, the first they just sleep. They don't do anything. They just sleep and eat. Kachim, nothing. That's all they did. But yet every morning when I would carry my kids and they would smile like this. We smile. We smile. Relax. As if you've won the lottery. <laughs> Look at that smile. And they started talking, they called you. Dad. <laughs> As if you've never heard that before. <laughs> Come on. You remember those? Mm -hmm. And then there's a contest between you and your spouse, of course. He called me first before you. <laughs> I just wanted to say, Dad first before Mom. <laughs> They lie. Did they do anything? Here's what it is. When you come to the Lord, when you pray, Lord God, God is smiling. Oh, he's calling me. Can you rest? Decided to read the word. God is smiling at you. Oh, he decided to spend time with me. God delights in you. But yet you've been preconditioned that you have to do something. So let me end with this. So where's this ending? And I'm, I'm going to pray. So after this baptism, if you want to open your Bible, in Mark chapter, Matthew chapter 3, right? In Matthew chapter 4, it's interesting because you can see here, look at this. Then Jesus went dead by the Spirit to the desert to be, temp to be tempted by the devil. Right after this, the temptation comes. He was led by the Spirit. He was brought there. To be tested, to be tempted. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, of course. I don't even have to last 40 days and 40 nights. If I don't eat lunch, I'm hungry by dinner. But yet, look at this. The tempter came to him and said, that's the devil. What was the question? If you are the son of God. The very thing that the father spoke to Jesus is the very thing that was tested right at the very start. If you are the son of God. But the 
just the Father just declared that. You are my son. So the question here is this. Would Jesus believe what the Father said? Or he would believe the lie of the enemy? And the first thing is this, what? Provision. Haven't you noticed when you're being tested with provision, the question is that, does God loves me? Am I a son? Am I important to the Lord? Sounds familiar? Next. So we could, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest part of the temple. What's the question again? If you are the son of God, if you have a relationship with him, if really that you are loved by God, if really that God delights in you, why are you in this state? We have a choice. We believe the voice that defines us, or the world, or the enemy that will try to define who you are. Join me in the word of prayer, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you, God, that you love us so much. Thank you, Lord. I want you to just close your eyes. Just close your eyes and take this moment. And let me read the truth for you. And I want this to sink in your heart. The truth is that you are a child of God. God will define you. If you have let this world define you, come to the Lord and say, God, forgive me. You have let relationships, money, define you. Lord, forgive me. Come on, come to the Lord and say, God, forgive me. Your family, your spouse. I love my spouse, and she loves me dearly, but God will define me, not her. Some of you, you're tired because you're pursuing some definition that God doesn't want. There are some things that God wants you to do. That is His calling. And as we follow that, then we are what? Fulfilled. Fulfillment comes when we obey Him. Not what the world would offer. Here's the next clue. God loves you. God loves you so much that He gave His life for you. God loves you. And I want you to say this God loves me. Come on, say it and mean it. God loves me. And God delights in you. You bring God great joy as you trust Him. Obedience as we obey Him, it brings Him great joy. Maybe you're feeling that you are not bringing God's joy. It's because you know that you're not obeying Him. It has to change. If you're here today, you know that this message touched you. Watch the raise your hand so let me pray for you in a sense that to understand this, God's love, God's definition, that God loves you, that God delights in you. Come on, raise your hands and let me pray for you. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters. Lord, thank you for this truth that you are putting in their hearts. They don't have to perform. Their value in worth is based on what you've done for them, not on what they did for you. That you died for them. Or today, even as we come before you, let it be God that we will grow in our relationship with you, understanding this truth. And or as the enemy question this, I pray that we will go back to your word and to this truth of who we are in you. That we belong to you. That we are here because of you. Without your hands. Lord, thank you and be honored in Jesus' name.
Come on, let's give God praise.